Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. In today's webinar, we will guide you through our TrueView Evo processing workflow, where we will focus on processing raw TrueView LiDAR imagery data to finished or CAD ready products. Before we get started, I'd like to go ahead and do an audio check. Please notice the raise your hand button has been circled in red on the slide. If you can hear me, please click this button now. We're seeing lots of hands and we'll give everybody just a minute I was, as we have a large group joining us today and have a few people coming in. Great. Looks like everybody can hear me. My name is Crystal Bailey and I will be moderating today's session. Joining me today is GOQ's VP of Special Projects, Martin Flood, and Vice President of Customer Success, Derek Wagg, who will be answering questions during the webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few things. Group audio has been disabled for this session. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the question box on your GoToWebinar panel. This session will be roughly 60 minutes. If we do not get to your question during this webinar, we will follow up with you by email. This webinar is being recorded and will be distributed to everyone registered. Now at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and launch a poll question to get us started. Please indicate your use of drone mapping slash inspection technology. Check all that apply. We'll leave this open for just a second. And then afterwards, we'll share the results with everybody to get a good idea of the user group with us today. All right, a few more votes coming in. So I'm gonna leave that open for just a second longer. All right, so we'll close out that poll and share those results. And it looks like we have 50% performing photogrammetric mapping using drones and then a combination of LiDAR and photogrammetric using drones. Great. So I'll go ahead and hide that poll. And thank you all for joining or for voting and joining me now is our VP of Special Projects, Martin Flood, and I will hand over the presentation to him now. Thanks, Crystal, and welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today for the next hour or so as we go through the uh, TrueView Evo software to look at some of the workflow uh, working with some of our LiDAR and uh, camera data sets. Let me just get set up here. Okay, you should be, uh, can I get a, just a, a video and audio check, Crystal? Yep, hear and see you great. Perfect. All right, well, again, thank you everybody for joining us today. I just have a very brief slide deck that I'm going to go through um, just to set up, and then I'm going to move over into TrueView Evo and spend most of the hour in the software uh, working through some data sets and showing you some of the workflows and some of the tools that are that are in Evo. So a uh, little bit about us because uh, we always uh, get new people coming to our webinars, which is great. This is a growing industry. We're starting to make new contacts, new relationships, meet uh, new customers and new organizations. So if you're not familiar with GeoQ, uh, we were founded in 2003 by Jim Medlock and Lewis Graham, uh, our CEO, um, uh, who probably many of you have, uh, have met or uh, have heard on some of these webinars in the past. We've got three main uh, locations. The corporate office is in Huntsville, Alabama. We have an office up here in Toronto in Canada. That's where I'm sitting today. And then we have GOQ Australia, which is based out of uh, Brisbane, Australia. And then of course we have uh, local resellers in, in different regions of the world as well. 
The focus of GeoQ has always been on LIDAR and imagery technology. We've always been building tools and solutions for helping doing geospatial processing fairly close to the sensor. Um, so uh, working with data that's coming out of the sensors to turn that and convert that into a product that, that our customers typically sell to the, to the end user. Uh, we started out as a software company. You may be very familiar with some of our software products, LP360, GeoQ. Um, but about seven or eight years ago, when the regulation started to change and it looked very much like the commercialization of drones was really going to change the way you could do some of this, these mapping projects, we started to move into providing end-to-end -end drone mapping solutions. And of course, that's what we're, we're going to talk most of today about. We've really got three core parts of the business, uh, the drone mapping that I mentioned, uh, but you may also be familiar with us. Uh, we uh, sell a lot of software into the airborne LIDAR and mobile LIDAR space. Uh, we work very closely. We've been the official North American reseller for TerraSolid for many years now. I mentioned our LP360 software, and of course, we do a lot of um, workflow consulting and training in that space. Um, and then, of course, the drone mapping that I mentioned. And then we do have a small component of the company that works with uh, enterprise solutions, uh, specifically looking at cloud hosting of data, cataloging of data, and some workflow tools uh, in, in the cloud, of course. But we want to talk to uh, tell you today about TrueView, uh, drone mapping, the workflow and the tools that we have in this space, looking at our TrueView Evo um, software. Uh, as many of you probably know, this, this um, business has really expanded, really grown, despite some of the challenges we've had with the, with the COVID pandemic. Uh, the last two, three, four, even going back five years, have really just seen a an emergence of this um, technology, drone mapping, whether it's photogrammetric or LIDAR or for other remote sensing or mapping applications has really uh, taken off. So we are very proud to be working with a lot of these companies uh, here, a lot of these government agencies. We've got a growing customer base of people that are adopting the TrueView technology uh, into their businesses and across a host of different vertical industries, as you can probably see here. Quick note about the hardware before I, I hop over and spend the rest of our hour in the software. Um, we have three main TrueView models uh, available right now. Uh, left to right in the upper left corner, we have our TrueView 410. That was the first model that we introduced just going back about two years ago now. It's built around a Quantergy uh, M8 laser scanner using a Planix APX15. We use a Planix for all of our INS uh, positioning solutions. We've worked with the Planix for many, many years. Great great solution, best in class, we feel, for, for what we want to do with our systems. Um, the central model there, the TrueView 515, is actually our newest model. It uses a HESI Pandar XT uh, 32, so it's a 32 channel. Uh, the Quantergy M8 is an eight channel sensor. Um, a really good solid um, uh, sensor for doing a lot of standard topo work. Been really impressed with the way the HESI pairs well with that that Aplanix. Uh, all of our sensors, of course, have dual mapping cameras, dual 20 megapixel RGB cameras as well. And of course, on the right hand side at the bottom there, uh, the top of the line uh, in our portfolio is, of course, the Regal integration. Uh, currently, the Regal Minivux 3 uh, paired with either an APX15 or an APX20, and again with, with the cameras. And of course, if you're familiar with the, the LiDAR industry and you've seen what's been happening in the space, you, you, you understand. So, you know, the price performance on these systems really. Um, goes as the LiDAR goes, as the positioning solution goes. So as you move from the 410 to the Regal Base 635, 640s, you're moving to higher quality uh, lasers, uh, better performing lasers that are purpose built for survey and mapping and, and better positioning solutions, um, which is not to say you, you, know, you can't get great quality data out of the other systems. It's just you will notice you as you move down that curve, or sorry, up that curve, you get more accurate data and less noise in your, in your point cloud. So that's the hardware. Uh, today, our focus, though, is going to be on the software because, you know, one of the challenges with uh, drone LiDAR in particular has been that, you know, there's a lot more choices on the hardware side than there would be, say, in a traditional LiDAR, uh, you know, fixed wing helicopter um, type solution. But you need to support that hardware with good, solid software tools that allow you to take that data that you've gone and collected in the field and convert that into a product that you're going to get, get paid for. 
and our TrueView Evo software, which comes out of our, our you know, our historical um, uh, presence in the software market with LP360 and building LiDAR tools, is really the integrated tool that gives you those answers. In, in addition to our, our TrueView hardware, we're giving you a full end-to-end -end software workflow um, to, to take that data and convert that into product. This is kind of an overview of that, that workflow. Um, we're going to focus today uh, primarily here. So we're not going to look at any of the flight planning or any of the field work, um, you know, any of the geometric correction. Those, those are topics for another day. Um, but we're going to look at what happens when you start importing the data. How do you do your geopositioning and your geocoding? Uh, how do you get your colorized point cloud? How do you then generate some products, an ortho photo, and some uh, engineering and CAD type products that you might want to pull out of the, the LiDAR data? So we're focusing very much on the area that I've got out, outlined here. I will just mention a couple of things. Um, because uh, I know we have some uh, current TrueView owners in the audience today. I just want to mention a couple of things related to both um, uh, creating ortho mosaics and or doing a geometric correction of, of the data. These are two very important steps, of course. Um, we've partnered uh, with both um, uh, uh, AggieSoft for MetaShape to integrate MetaShape as our ortho mosaic engine. And we're actually doing a tight integration with MetaShape. It should be out in next couple of versions I think. I'll be using that today for doing my ortho photo generation but it's a really nice integration um, when you're using MetaShape and you can use that if you have an existing MetaShape license or we will have MetaShape for Evo or MFE as we're calling it as an additional product you could purchase. So if you don't if you don't have those tools you can get them bundled in with your with your TrueView Evo um, software. Now you can also create your ortho photos in external packages. We fully support Pix4D and uh, of course generic outputs of your of your geotag pictures, uh, geotag photos to flow into other softwares, a correlator 3D and so forth. Um, on the geometric correction part, uh, we partnered with uh, Bayes Mapping, uh, Bayes Map for their strip align program. Some of you may be familiar with that. That's also going to be tightly integrated within the TrueView Evo um, workflow as, as a strip align for Evo or, or safe as, as we're calling that. So I just wanted to mention those there before we move on. Quick note about the test site. So I'm going to show you some data for in a second here. Uh, so this is one of the, well, it is now the main test site that we fly all of our systems in. It's also, if you come down for training, this is where you'll be flying. Uh, it's also the new headquarters for GeoQ in, in, in Madison. Uh, we moved in, I think, two, three months ago. Uh, really nice site for testing. Uh, we've got a lot of good surfaces, some good hard, clean surfaces, a lot of really heavy southern uh, pine forests, as you can see there, which is great for, for looking at canopy penetration. Uh, some agricultural land in the south, some built up areas as, as well. So a really nice test site. And um, unlike our previous location, uh, completely in uncontrolled airspace, which of course is really nice. Okay, so let me hop over to Review Evo. And I'm just gonna go ahead and bring that up. Should pop up here in a second, make sure it's on the right screen. Okay, so um, Crystal, can you just confirm you're now seeing TrueView Evo? I can see it. Perfect. So, as I said, I, I do notice we do have some current TrueView users in the audience. Uh, so, just for those of you, I am using one of our, our latest builds. So you're going to see a, a, some differences in, in the GUI as we go through here, as we're continually adding uh, new tools. And this may be, uh, you know, the first time you've seen this sort of startup wizard um, that we've we've added in here. So if you are a current TrueView Evo user, uh, don't worry if you see some little variations or differences uh, in, in the um, uh, in the GUI and in the the workflows we go through. Uh, these are all things that will be coming in the next uh, next version release. So I want to start up a new project. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start this by um, importing an Evo cycle. So cycle is just a term we use for essentially a mission or lift or flight. Um, so it's the set of data that's been downloaded from the um, uh, from the drone when you come back after doing that that collect, typically on a memory stick, and then transferred to your laptop where you could be processing or brought back to the office and, and moved onto your onto your network. So that's what I'm going to start with by uh, importing a cycle into a new project. Now, 
there are a couple of different options here. What I'm going to do is import a cycle from an archive. So we've added capabilities in TrueView Evo to archive and back up your cycles, which of course is very important. That, uh, that archive can be on a local um, uh, repository. It can also be archived up into the cloud in our Reckon uh, web portal. Again, we're not going to talk a lot about Reckon today, but if you are a TrueView user, you know that Reckon is essentially the web portal that ties everything together uh, in terms of things like system calibration, which we'll see in a few minutes and so forth. It also has a basically cloud hosted archiving system for your cycle. So you can always be having a cloud backup of your data. In this particular case, I do have it on a local archive, uh, which is right here. So I can see a list. I've only got one archive uh, in this particular uh, location. Uh, you know, if I were to check some of the others, I'd have a, a larger collection, of course. We'll go ahead and grab that one. Now, this data set is from our uh, 640. So it's a, the uh, top of the line model. It's got the Regal Minivux uh, 3 with the APX uh, 20. Um, so that's the, the, the data set that we'll be looking at. Just need to decompress it here for a second. Um, it won't take too long to go through that, and then it'll move us on. Okay, so the archive, of course, is uh, compressed data. We've now decompressed it. It's asked me for a little bit of information. I've got a default uh, folder where I keep all of my projects. Um, I do need to give it a unique project name. We'll just use that 22nd today. That should be fine. It pulls some of the information from that archive, from that, that uh, raw data flight. So it already knows, for instance, the spatial reference system I'm going to be using. This was taken at our, our Triana campus. So it is Alabama East. We're going to be working in State Plain and we were using a local base station. So we're going to use a single base station for our, our positioning uh, strategy. Just want to confirm it's got the observation file there. I do have to make one change here. Our, local base station actually isn't on a tripod, so we don't actually have an antenna height. So we just need to take that out. Now, of course, it is a reference point, which we've got surveyed in. Here we go, so I can just grab that. So this is a catalog, you know, obviously you're gonna, especially if you're moving around and doing customer surveys, you're gonna build up uh, some common uh, survey nail points, reference points that you're setting your base stations up on. You can build a catalog of those so you're not having to re-enter the information uh, uh, each time. You can also build these up if you've got Opus reports as well. We can just import those as well. So generally looks good. I've got one little warning here, and this is because there's actually a little bit of, um, uh, there's, a, there's a problem with the header in that file. I'll fix that in, in a minute. Um, really, it is right on that, that location site um, for that. But it does flag you if there are some issues. Now, obviously, there's a major issue here because that's a huge distance. But, you know, if you were using, if you picked the wrong survey nail and you were out by five or ten miles, you would get that flagged as, as well, which is a more easy sort of finger slip type mistake to, to use uh, or to see. So go ahead and finish that. And it's going to go ahead and create my project for me. So what it's doing now is uh, reading the raw cycle files, which consist of all of the raw observables that were collected during flight. So that's the laser ranges, the scan angles, uh, the rover GNSS information, everything associated with the APX15, plus of course some additional uh, system data and, and uh, ancillary data that we track as well um, on, on the sensor. And again, that's downloaded on, on uh, essentially a, a memory stick that you just uh, uh, pull off the sensor, or pull off the, the TrueView sensor when it lands and then just transfer a uh, copy over either to a field laptop where you can do the processing or as I said, bring back into the office um, to, to move over to your system. It's also copying over the uh, the camera images. As I mentioned, uh, all of our TrueView sensors have two uh, 20 megapixel RGB cameras, camera one, camera two, port and starboard. Um, they're mounted obliquely um, and they're set so that the combined field of view matches the field of view of the, of the LiDAR. Okay. So now we've set up our project in TrueView Evo. If you haven't seen TrueView Evo before, like a lot of engineering software, lots of buttons, lots of menus and so forth. Um, I'll try to keep us focused on the things I think it's important to, to, 
to um, for you to take away and, and uh, understand what's going on. So don't worry too much about all, all of the buttons. We'll, we'll focus on what we need to do. Essentially what the project is though, is we've got a, a table of contents or a legend over here and we have different layers in our project. So Trueview Evo is very GIS-like, very CAD-like. We have different layers with different types of data on them. All of these layers were automatically created from that raw data, the, from that cycle data that I imported. And you can see here, it's essentially created some uh, some trajectory points. Uh, it's created a, a trajectory. Uh, it's created both uh, camera stations and photos. I'll turn some of these off so it's a little bit easier to see. Um, and we'll actually turn off the trajectory points. So it's a little bit simpler display. So the green line is our trajectory, uh, our real-time trajectory. We haven't done any post-processing on that yet. And then we have our, our, our camera stations for each of the, the uh, camera exposures. And we pulled in a Google layer as a, as a backdrop in there. Now, I just do want to go ahead. I'm just going to do this off screen here. I'm just going to correct this um, observation file error that I had there. Apologize for that quick to fix. Okay. So now we've got our project set up. We have our, our, um, our data imported, we want to start doing our uh, Evo processing. And we're going to go through some major steps here. We're going to um, first get our positioning solution. So we're going to run through a plan because pause pack to get a post-process trajectory. That is a, a refined, a smooth, best estimate trajectory of the drone during the flight, because obviously that's going to impact our, our accuracy. Uh, we're going to create our trajectories um, that we want to process to generate our actual point cloud, our LAS data. And then we're going to do the geocoding. So the geocoding is the primary step where we basically take that raw range data and create that XYZ point cloud that's properly geo-referenced uh, in, in, in your reference frame. And then we'll start looking at some of the things we can do to pull product out of that and some of the things we can do uh, to generate an ortho photo. So um, pause pack. As I said, we work very closely with Aplanix. We, we love their um, their APX systems. Well, all of their gear is good. We use their APXs, um, but we use their pause pack processing software for doing uh, the the trajectory generation. And there's two versions that you can access uh, within TrueView Evo. Um, if you have an owned system, that if you've, if you've purchased a TrueView Evo sensor, uh, that will come with pause pack uh, UAV desktop. So it's basically a desktop version of pause pack that you can run and call directly from, um, uh, from within TrueView Evo. Um, if you have a subscription, if you're renting a sensor, uh, a TrueView sensor from us, that comes essentially with a PausePack cloud account, which is essentially a subscription service that allows you to do your PausePack processing up in the cloud, uh, of course. You can use the cloud processing with an own system as well. You don't have to use the desktop version, but uh, of course it is a subscription service, so you do pay for some of that um, depending on, on the type of positioning that you're using. You can see I actually uh, can select here whether I want to run locally or whether I want to run uh, via the cloud. I'll select cloud here just to talk a little bit about TrueView points. Um, so because it is a subscription service, that subscription is included uh, with your TrueView uh, Reckon account. This is where we manage it. There's Reckon again. Um, and so you, it's uh, it's like any subscription plan. You have to have a certain amount of points to um, you know process. And it's done by essentially what we call kinematic minute. Uh, basically in motion uh, processing time. But it will tell you, you know, sort of what your account balance is. It'll give you an estimate of how much it's going to pro uh, charge, uh, you know, how many points it's going to be to process a certain certain mission. Uh, once you've processed a trajectory once, you don't get charged for it again. It's just a one-time fee. So I've already processed this trajectory, so it's not actually going to charge me anything for that. Here is basically just confirming all the information that I, um, that it, uh, obtain when I did the uh, import. So again, we can see here's my um, uh, my base station location. Um, you know some some details about it. Nothing really here, but just to verify this is indeed what uh, uh, everything looks okay. And again, for this particular setup, because we're not running on top of tripod, I just make sure that antenna height is zero. 
I do need to tell it um, the target frame, you know, what the reference frame is I want for my output. Very often that's going to be the same as your project because typically, you know, good practice is always set your project up in the reference frame that you want to be, but it doesn't have to be. You can, you can reproject um, here if you want, uh, but I'm just going to set this to Alabama East exactly as it should be. And I'm not doing any orthometric correction today. We're just going to leave these as ellipsoid heights. Uh, find a little bit of summary and I could go ahead and I can click submit here and it would basically batch up this uh, process, send it up to the cloud and pull it back. I'm not actually going to run that today just because it does take a few minutes and especially when we're doing these webinars, the bandwidth can be, um, you know, uh, struggle a little bit with the bandwidth. So I have actually already pre-processed this and we'll pull it. But basically, if you were pulling it, you could have submit, you'd get a variety of status messages as that cloud processing was was done. Now, when it completes, we do get a report. I'm just going to pull that up here. Uh, if I can find it here, where did it go? Yeah, here we go. So this is a standard pause pack report. Uh, if you're familiar with these, you understand there's a lot of really detailed technical information in here. If you haven't seen these before, don't worry too much about it. We tend to focus on a couple of things to look at to determine, you know, what was the quality of the, the positioning solution that we got. Um, let me scroll up here a little bit. Here we go. So we can get some uh, some QC information, some QC statistics on our on our positioning solution. If I look at this top table and kind of ignore the the, the top part, but if I look down here, I can see was I getting a fixed solution, a float, or or no solution? Obviously, we want fixed. We had 100% uh, fixed, which is great. That's what we want for all of our epochs in in our flight. So that's pretty good. Perhaps more interesting, where I tend to go and look first, is if I look at my position area. So this is my smooth, um, so backwards forward uh, positioning error here. So it's a RMS value. Um, the vertical here is in meters. And then of course it's just time. This is just our flight here. There's actually three lines on there. Hopefully you can see those on the webcast. Um, the red line is the northing, the blue line is the easting, and then the sort of green line is the, the vertical or, or the down. So we can see that we've got a position error from our from our trajectory solution, our, our post-process trajectory solution, that's you know sub two centimeter. It's about 1.2, 1.3 in planimetric in X, Y, and about 1.9 in vertical, which is really good. That's 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 what we like to see. We certainly want these well below um, three centimeters or so. So now that I've done that post-processing, I've got that refined trajectory, I need to take my flight and I need to basically uh, calculate, come on, here we go, uh, some flight lines. So we're going to process our data by flight line and by trajectory. We want to go ahead and create those because as you can see here, you know, there's some initial takeoff and transit and, and you know, there may be other sections of your actual flight that aren't really relevant to where you want to actually uh, process your data. So we do want to go ahead and, and do that. We have a tool here that will just automatically take a look at the flights for us, calculate uh, what it feels are, based on the parameters here, what it feels are the appropriate flight lines. So you can see, for instance, here it's cut out my transit lines here, my north-south lines that I don't want. Um, that's generally pretty good, so I'm going to go ahead and accept that. I do have a couple of extra lines I want to get rid of. You know, Truvi Evo, because it's built on our core LP360 engine, does have a full feature editor. It'll work with uh, vector data, point data, um, uh, rasters. Uh, it's not just for your LiDAR and your ortho TrueView data. Uh, it's a full featured um, uh, LiDAR analysis package. So we support the other data types as well. So I can quite easily, um, I'm just going to select that particular line. And if you look on the south here, you'll see there actually was an additional transit they did in this flight to get back to our north-south strip, this cross strip that they went up, up here. So I've got two extra lines here I don't really want to generate any data from, so I'm going to go ahead and delete those. And I'll save those. Flight lines. Now, the next step is to create my actual trajectories. This can be sometimes a little bit 
um, if you're new to the workflow, get your head around. So I've got my flight lines, but those flight lines aren't based on my refined, my post-process trajectory. What I want to do is actually have a trajectory for each of these flight lines from that post-process trajectory. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to create these what we call true view trajectories. Um, it does seem a little bit redundant, but we are basically providing a more refined position solution along our, our trajectories. And there's a couple of other important steps along here that we want to talk about. So this is a, quite an important dialogue. Um, as I mentioned, I didn't actually run the clouds, uh, so I'm just going to uh, go import um, the previously processed trajectory in here. If I had actually run uh, the cloud processing or the desktop processing, it would have just defaulted to that. So this is pointing to my refined trajectory. The middle section here is very important. This is where we talk about, or we handle the calibration of the sensor. So a drone LiDAR sensor, um, just similar to any LiDAR sensor or any camera, you know, it's a remote sensing uh, mapping instrument. We need to have a calibration for that. Um, so that we're using, you know, the, the correct lever arms, we've got the correct bore sites between the LIDAR um, field of view, the LIDAR look angle, and the reference frame of the IMU, and a variety of other things in there. Basically, we need to have a calibration file. All of our TrueView calibration is handled and coordinated, again, through that Reckon portal that I mentioned. So uh, TrueView Evo will automatically check in. You can see here it knows the serial number of this particular sensor that collected this particular data. And it will check both for the date on the calibration file uh, from what we call the cycle resident or you know what was on the system when it was flying and what's the actual latest available calibration date. And you see this is actually has a very out of date uh, file. So they were flying with a very out of date calibration file when they did the collect. But Reckon's noticed that is flagged and said, hey, you know, there's actually a calibration uh, file available from, um, you know, from June 16th of, of this year. Our recommendation is always you just use that latest calibration file. It's the one that'll be less, the most accurate. But of course, you are for diagnostic purposes, you may want to use an older file. You may want to go back and browse through. We keep a record of all of the calibration files for your sensor um, online. So you could go through and go to those. But we'll just use the latest one here. So I've got my trajectory, I've got my calibration set up. The bottom section here, or I guess the third section down, refers to the images. So we are going to generate an ortho photo from our oblique images. Um, again, similar to with the LiDAR, you know, the, the camera is collecting images uh, along the whole flight. Um, we don't necessarily want all of those images. Uh, we just want to have certain retained photos that will work for the, you know, the project site and the ortho that we want to um, want to generate. Uh, typically, the first option, just retain the photos within the flight lines, is, is generally what we use. That's basically saying, you know, wherever I have a blue line, keep my photos for those uh, for those photo centers and use use those. I could include my interior turns. So I had removed these from my LiDAR processing, um, but I could include the images here if I wanted to, or I could just keep all of my photos if I felt as well. But obviously photos in here, photos of the ground as I'm taking off or landing, those aren't of interest to me. So I'm just gonna retain the photos within the blue, blue fight lines. And then the final section here on this dialogue is uh, TrueView Evo will update the EXIF tags uh, with what we call true pose information. Essentially, it's going to more accurately geotag, geocode those images based on the refined trajectory that we now have because we did the, the pause pack processing. I can do that updating those EXIF tags now, but I'm going to do it later just to show you how, how that works if you do it a little bit later in the, in the workflow. So I'll just go ahead and create these trajectories. It'll go through this fairly quickly here. Okay, successful. It's created my retained photos layers and so forth, so we're we're good. Okay. So we've created our refined trajectory, we've created our flight lines, and then we've created our actual trajectories that we're going to use for processing um, the LiDAR data and our image data. So the next step is to go ahead and, and generate that. So it's to actually run the geocoding of the LiDAR data. This one actually doesn't take too long. This isn't a particularly large project. Uh, and, you know, 
one of the things to to mention at this point is you know one of the differences between say a lidar and a photogrammetric drone project or um, you know uh, 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 site that you're mapping is you know lidar processing typically is much faster um, to to process through to get to your dam to get to your elevation here. So we're going to go ahead and do this geocoding, and I've just got some settings here. I'm going to clip um, to plus minus 40 degrees. All, all of our models, uh, all of our TreeView models are 360 degree scanners, uh, so the, the LiDAR system is fully rotating around that um, that axis. You typically, of course, don't want to um, keep all of that information in these drone uh, nadir looking type uh, 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 scenarios. Uh, basically, as to the further you go off nadir, it impacts your accuracy, your canopy penetration, and so forth. So typically, remember, we recommend keeping this to plus minus 45, plus minus 40, or even, even lower than that. We'll leave it at 40. I'm going to clip the range a little just to make sure I'm focused on the, the good data area. And then I'm going to enable this true track, which basically is like swath compensation. Essentially, it makes sure that uh, the dynamics of the aircraft are taken into account in determining the, um, you know, this plus minus 40 degrees. So my my field of view is not wandering off as my as my drone uh, uh, with my drone dynamics. And I'm going to colorize the point cloud. I'll go ahead and kick that off. Now this will take about a minute or two. So um, We've got a couple of things I want to talk to, but I noticed we have a, um, a couple of questions here. Uh, so someone was asking, uh, is the TrueView EVA software uh, only compatible with the TrueView hardware? So TrueView EVO is built on our LP360 software engine. So all of the tools that I'm showing you to deal with processing the data from the drone, the data from the sensor, are TrueView specific. So you, you, you can't process another vendor's hardware in our TrueView Evo. And that's pretty standard across the industry. Most, uh, most hardware vendors have some proprietary code, they have some proprietary steps to take the raw data off their hardware, their sensor, and produce the point cloud and potentially the ortho photo and, and so forth. So you can't use this to generate a point cloud from another vendor's um, hardware. It's specific to our TrueView Evo products. Having said that, once you have an LAS file, so once you've got a standard LiDAR point cloud or once you've got a standard ortho, you can import those into a TrueView Evo project no problem. Again, it's built on top of our LP360 engine, which is our standard software for working with any LiDAR data or actually any point cloud data. Wouldn't have to be drone LiDAR, it could be traditional airborne LiDAR, it could be mobile LiDAR, it could be photometric uh, point clouds. So I'm getting a little bit uh, uh, long-winded there, but uh, no, you can't use the software to process other people's data from their hardware, but once you've got the point cloud and the ortho, then you can pull those into any, any TrueView Evo project. Okay. So we finished generating our uh, point cloud. Let me just zoom out a little bit here. I'm gonna change my display. There's a lot of different options for displays um, in TrueView Evo. And just for time purposes, I'm not gonna go through a lot of these. I'm just gonna actually change from a point display uh, to a, a tin display here. So we can see that we've got that. And I'm gonna turn off some of the, I don't need my trajectory points. Uh, I don't need my retained photo centers for now. So there I've got a nice colorized point cloud. Remember that is the point cloud, it's the tin of the point cloud, it's not the ortho image yet. But you know, we're typically collecting pretty high density data with these drone LiDAR systems. The 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 640 is probably going to be collecting around 100, 100 points per square meter, something in that uh that range from these kind of flying heights. So we have a point cloud, we have a colorized point cloud. We want to start thinking about how do we use um, some of the additional tools in Evo to generate um, some product from, from that? I'm going to come back to that because what I want to do now is walk you through how we would generate the ortho photo, uh, and then we'll, we'll pull that in as well. As I mentioned um, at the beginning in the slide deck, uh, so we work very closely with, uh, with Aggieseft, uh, excuse me, Aggieseft. Um, we have Metashape integrated um, so that you can basically create a photo package and then 
uh, kick off uh, MetaShape, as I'm going to show you here in a second. We do the same with Pix4D. It's a, a little bit more, uh, a little less handshaking with Pix4D, but you can do the same thing, create a Pix4D photo package, and then just pull that into Pix4D. Um, we're also in the process of um, directly integrating MetaShape into, as I mentioned, um, MFE or MetaShape for Evo, which you'll be able to use um, directly uh, from within within Evo, you won't need a separate MetaShape license. If you do have a separate MetaShape license, you can continue to to use that. So a couple of things I mentioned um, updating the EXIF tags. I didn't do that. I could have done that um, when I was doing the trajectories. I'm going to do it now, um, just to have that run through that. This is again taking because we now have a post-process trajectory. We've got a refined trajectory. Uh, position for all of our photo centers, including updated what we call again the true pose information, the proper um, uh, pointing and angular information about the, the photo center. Um, so we can uh, use that to update the EXIF tags um, uh, for the for the photos. That uh, message that I was just saying, you know, there are some photos that are outside of my uh, trajectory area, uh, and I'm not that interested in, in those, so it'll move those into what it'll call a real-time folder, or basically ones that don't have updated uh, EXIF information. Um, someone was asking in the questions there about how high this uh, flight was. I believe that this particular flight was at 75 meters. Um, just seeing if I have that. So I don't actually have that information here, but I think I think this was at uh, uh, 75 to 80 meters was typically what this would have been flown at. Uh, it's relatively flat here, so they weren't using terrain following or anything like that. So just a standard 75 meters. Okay, so we've updated the EXIF tags. So now we've got nice geocoding on all of our uh, all of our oblique images. So we want to go ahead and we want to create uh, what we call a photo package. So this step here, essentially, I just need to give it a location where it's going to create a photo package for me. And we'll go into our webinar, create a new folder in here, outputs. And a new one called photo package. Oops, helps if I can. So we'll go ahead and export that photo package there. So what that's going to do is copy the images over. Uh, it'll also put the um, uh, camera calibration files both for um, for MetaShape and also for Pix4D in those outputs. So you can basically take that folder and use that as the input to your um, to your MetaShape session or your Pix4D session. If I had multiple um, cycles, multiple lifts, I could continue to export out into that folder, and it's going to create a, a merged or combined list of all of my all of my images. So once I have that um, photo package, now if I'm using MetaShape or uh, uh, MetaShape for Evo, I can directly kick off that ortho photo generation from here. Relatively straightforward dialog. I, we need to know where that photo package is. It'll confirm the coordinate system. Um, there are a couple of steps here that um, will It'd be more meaningful if you are a MetaShape uh, user. Um, for instance, it talks about running alignment here. One of the advantages of using um, uh, Tree View Evo for this is because we have more detailed information on those images, we can keep track of areas where, as you may know in MetaShape, it may not be able to, to fix the images. You may have, uh, you know, in Canopy or something like that. And we can use the updated, more accurate information so we can use the true view angles for any of those photos that don't get aligned during the alignment steps. It can help you fill in some of those voids in your ortho uh, in those situations. Uh, and of course, we want to generate the ortho mosaic. The other advantage that we can uh, use when we're using TrueView Evo, when we're, we're calling MetaShape from TrueView Evo, you know, I do need an elevation surface. I'm generating an ortho photo. Typically, if you're just doing this as a photogrammetric workflow, of course, you would just use the point cloud uh, that's generated. So it would do the autocorrelation on the images. It would have a point cloud. It would then use that point cloud for for its elevation surface to generate the ortho. We have the advantage that we've collected LIDAR directly with our imagery. So we could use a LIDAR DEM in here as well. 
So we do have that option, and uh, if I have time at the end, I'll come back and show you that. Now, I'm not actually going to kick this off. Um, it's still a photogrammetric processing step that's uh, fairly time-consuming uh, on my machine, which is a bit of an older machine. Uh, it doesn't process as nicely as the as the geocoding. Uh, but basically, you would kick it off. It'll start that batch process of, of uh, Metashape and uh, does have an email notification. I'm sorry, I dismissed the dialog that'll tell you when that starts and when that, that finishes. And then basically, when you're finished, we can go pull that raster in. So again, similar to the pause pack, I'm just going to uh, use the old uh, cooking show approach and go to the other oven where I've already got my ortho generated. And we'll go ahead and pull that into our project. And see what happened to my, my Evo. Not sure what happened there. Bear with me for a second. Okay, so um, turn off my LiDAR and my Google. So here is our uh, ortho that we generated from, from Metashape that we've pulled in here. Um, you know, if you've done any work with drone photogrammetry, uh, you know, I mean, the ortho quality, if you've got a good quality camera, um, very, very nice quality orthos. Um, I think the GSD on this is about two centimeters. Yes, uh, two centimeters. So now we're in a position, um, we've got about 15 minutes left. So I do want to move on and, and talk a little bit about some of the product generation and um, what you can do with the data, especially if you're pushing to say a CAD, CAD workflow. Um, you know, we're in a position now, we've got a colorized point cloud, we've got an ortho, that actually may be our product. You know, we may have a customer where what they're asking for is just, you know, just give me the point cloud, give me the ortho, because I'm going to do some of my own value add work there. So at this point, we could be finished. But mostly, you know, these days, there is some additional work that, um, that you want to do to uh, generate a specific product. Um, we'll start by talking a little bit about... Um, I'll just turn the raster off for now. A um, little bit about doing a ground classification. So I'm going to switch the colorization here. So that was our colorized um, uh, LIDAR uh, cloud. This is colorized by class. And actually, I guess I can just show you, you know, this is colorized by um, elevation here in a second. So these are standard views of point clouds you're probably very familiar with. Um, obviously, a, uh, a standard step at this point is to do a ground classification, and that's what we're going to go ahead and, and, and kick off here quickly. So now we're getting into some of the tools that are built into TrueView Evo, because it's built again on that LP360 architecture, that are, are tools that are universal across working with LiDAR or any point cloud cloud data, but it's a really important part of the workflow to have these um, have these tools available and, on, you know, in a single environment, a single workflow, so you're not hopping out into other packages or moving data back and forth between different, different packages. So I'm going to introduce you to uh, point cloud tasks. Uh, so point cloud tasks are just the term that we use within uh, TrueView Evo for what are essentially macros or processing scripts or algorithms that you can create to do certain types of uh, an analysis or classification on your point cloud data and other features in your in your um, project. Um, I don't. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the details of, of ground classification. I'm just going to do a couple of very common steps that, again, if you're familiar with it or you've worked with LiDAR, you'll understand where I'm going here. I'm going to do initially just a, a quick low points filter. That's to get rid of any low point noise that's in the uh, 
in the data set because the way the ground classification works, at least the, you know, as it's implemented in TrueView Evo, it's an adaptive TIN approach. That's the, the technical term for how it works. Basically means you want to get rid of low points because they're going to start by creating busts in your surface right off the bat. So we can quickly do that. You notice I just selected the, the point from a drop-down list. So the way that point clouds are set up in TrueView Evo, there's a core catalog of um, tasks that come with the software. But you, of course, build up your own catalog over time. You can create uh, variations of all of the tasks. You can link tasks together in a macro, so you can have multiple steps that run in, in a row. Um, you can uh, save and exchange those tasks with colleagues. Um, you know, it's a very flexible system, but it also lets you build up some of your own expertise in terms of you will have certain ways that you want to do your processing. You're not tied into our definition of, of how a particular task has to be configured. You can build that up and, and change the variables and, and dive as deep as you want into it, uh, you know, within what we've exposed within it. So you build up a catalog and that's essentially what you're looking at here, a list of, of my tasks for, for doing true view processing at, at least. Um, so we did some uh, low points and now I'm just going to go ahead and run the ground classification. This all looks good. I've got this pre-configured so I'm just going to go ahead and, and run this. Now as I mentioned, um, so the, the approach we take for ground classification is a very standard approach. It's used been used with LiDAR data for uh, 20 plus years. It's called an adaptive TIN approach. There's a lot of uh, strength to it. Um, uh, a lot of, uh, it's a very reliable way to do these ground classifications. Like any al algorithm, it has its strengths and weaknesses. There's certain areas that it doesn't work with as well. And you do need to, um, you know, have an understanding of how that adaptive TIN works to be able to troubleshoot and optimize uh, uh, things. So, you know, training on these sort of tools is, is a big part of what you want to make sure that you you get when you're first starting to work with this um, this LiDAR data. This particular project, by the way, um, I think it's about a little bit under three gigs total size of the data. So that gives you some sense of, uh, you know, uh, the size of data and the processing time. So it took just under a minute to do the, the ground classification here. So now, again, if you're quite new to this, that this is orangey brown is, of course, where we have ground. We have other views that we can use. Um, just pop those up while we have them here. So I can do a 3D view here. Oops. I can also do a profile view. And I'll just do a thin profile, half meter or something like that. So these are standard views that you're probably familiar with if you've worked with uh, LiDAR data. Let's see if I can get this to lock here. There we go. So I've got a ground surface. Now, um, we are coming uh, towards the end of the hour. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, cleaning up the ground surface. If you've worked with LiDAR data, you know that is something that you need to do. Um, I can actually see, you know, there's areas here in this parking lot that didn't classify very well. So I could come in here and I could um, use some of the cleanup tools or I have a macro that does some cleanup on um, on the ground surface. I also have some manual cleanup tools I can do as well. Just suffice to say, again, LP360 is a full featured point cloud editing package. So you're able to use those tools to do cleanup and uh, manual editing or QAQC of the, uh, of the data as you're going along. Let me just zoom this out here. So, um, you know, there was a question in the in the, the Q and A about the fuzziness of of the data, and I'm just going to draw a profile. This is a road across the top here, so I can turn on my do some intensity coding here. I'll just draw a profile across that that road. So the fuzziness or noisiness of the data. Um, you know, with drone LiDAR, that's an important um, aspect of, of what you want to, um, 
want to take into account. So as I mentioned, automotive class LIDARs that are used in say, uh, you know, like the HESI or, or, or the, um, the Quantergy, they will be noisier than a Regal. A Regal is a purpose-built survey instrument. It has, it has very low noise. This is the Regal uh, Minibux 3, and I think we have, it's under five centimeters of peak-to-peak -peak noise. I'm not sure if those points really show up in the in the webcast, but that's our, our you know we're getting a relatively flat surface. You can um, we have tools within TrueView Evo that allow you to smooth the flat surfaces, which is something that can be done with any data, can be done with the noisier data as well. Uh, I will say for the Regal sensors, though, you often don't have to unless you're you know trying to get the absolute. Um, um, uh, smoothest data that you want. The shot-to-shot -shot noise, the precision of the Regals, um, it's on the order of one and a half, two centimeters, something like that, uh, 10 to 20 mils in the, in that range. So depending again on the type of product you're doing with a Regal, you don't have to worry too much about it. But we do have tools that will let you smooth the data and you can of course smooth the noisier data as well. So I have a ground surface now, and so obviously uh, I can filter this down to just show my ground. This might be something where I want to start thinking about um, generating some uh, some output from this. Um, you know, I can see areas below my canopy where I don't have as many points. Again, I would clean up these areas um, if I was, you know, doing this in an actual production environment. There's a couple of different ways that um, we can uh, we can work with the the data. The example I'm going to use here to wrap up is let's say we want to generate a DTM. So we want a, a digital terrain model of our surface, and we want to thin that um, so that we're not um, delivering a very large uh, data file to our customer or to our engineering group or whoever we're we're um, we're delivering data to. I'm just going to pull up a, a dialog here. Again, don't worry about all the different options. The main thing I'm doing here is you can see this is my class table. And if you look in the count, it'll actually tell me how many points I have in each of my classes. The main thing is I've got 6.4 million points in my ground class. That is still going to be a very big data file if someone wants a digital um, terrain model. So I want to thin that uh, a fair bit. So um, there's a couple of ways to do that. The one that I'm going to use is some statistical thinning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to again run a point cloud task to thin this surface. Just make my profile a little bit smaller. And uh, again, don't worry about all the different, don't worry too much about all the different options. Mainly what I'm doing is some statistical sampling. Um, I'm doing this on a one meter cell size and for each one meter cell I'm keeping the minimum elevation, maximum elevation, medium, and five additional random points. So I'm keeping eight points per square meter. That's not a random number I just picked. Again, if you are a LIDAR person uh, and you've worked with USGS data, you understand that there are quality levels from the airborne LIDAR industry uh, and, and eight points per square meter is a QL1, the, the densest data that they're getting in these large county and statewide data sets, uh, although that's gonna change, of course. Uh, so eight is not just random, it's to ma match QL1 um, data. And I'm gonna put this data and I'm gonna put it into class six, just so I have it in a separate class. Everything looks good here. I don't need my shape file. And there we go. So we'll go ahead and apply that. And I'll go ahead and run that, that task. So basically I'm doing a statistical thinning here. I'm gonna keep eight points per, per square meter. I'm essentially going to generate a QL1. That's the USGS LiDAR specification quality level one. Uh, in terms of density, uh, DTM. I'll take a minute here. Now, the trade-off, or I shouldn't say the trade-off, a limitation of this approach, this statistical approach, is that this is still LIDAR data in the sense that it is still randomly distributed. That is, you know, within each of those one meter cells, I may only have eight points, but they're randomly distributed um, because it was randomly sampled. And I can just switch this over to show just those points. And I'll also redo my scan here. So 
So you can see we had about 6.4 million points, uh, thinning it down to QL1 level and, and at 750,000 points. That's still a lot of points. That's still a fairly big file, especially if you're flowing into a, a, a CAD uh, a CAD type environment. Just have to update my files here and we should be able to see those points. Now we are coming up to the top of the hour. Uh, I, I do want to respect people's time, but I do. I will keep going for about another five minutes um, just to uh, close this out and show you one or two more things. So uh, by all means, uh, obviously do, do stay with us. If you do have to go, we appreciate that. There will be a recording available afterwards so you'll be able to catch the last little bit. Um, uh, after that. So apologize for running a little long, but I do think it's important. I do want to kind of finish this off here. So here's my uh, my model key points. And again, if I zoom in, you can see, I mean, it's just random sample like we like we would with any, any LIDAR data. What I may want to give my engineering um, department or my, my client, of course, is a DTM that's a regularized grid. So I've got a regular grid spacing uh, of, of elevation points. And I can do that quite easily in, in Evo. Uh, it lets me show you a couple of things. The first one is I can show you the export wizard. So this would be something that you would use, not just for the particular use case we're talking about here, doing a regularized DTM, but for any kind of export. If you just wanted to write the points out, but you needed to change the version to say ASCII, uh, or write them out actually into a, a CAD file, you can do that as well here. Of course, you wanna make sure you're not writing out you know, millions of points to do that. Um, you can change LAS versions. You can do a lot of different things with the export wizard. We're going to export a surface and we're going to do this as a one meter uh, grid and export elevation. And I'm basically going to create myself a GeoTIFF from this. So basically I'm rasterizing my thinned DTM points. Make sure that my source point are just my thin surface, if this comes up in a second here. Yeah, I don't want all of my classes, I just want my class eight. Okay. And I want this whole area. And we're going to save this out. To my DTM. And we'll just call this, this was one meter DTM. And we'll go ahead and generate that. Now, having these ground surfaces, um, of course, there's other things that I could be doing while this finish. Well, actually, it's pretty quick to, to kick that out. So, uh, but let me finish that thought. There are other things that we could be doing with this ground surface. Um, uh, cross sections is a, a good example we use a lot in training where you may need to uh, generate uh, cross sections across, say, the road here or in the field. There are some automated tools in Evo that will let you uh, let you do that. And whenever you're doing those kind of tasks, because you have the point cloud as a ground surface, you can conflate or drape those cross sections to that to that LIDAR um, data. So I've got this DTM as a raster, and I'm going to go and actually convert it back to points. Again, it seems a bit redundant, but the reason I'm doing this is because I want to get that, that regularized grid. So I'm just going to grab the, the GeoTIFF. And I'm going to, uh, sorry, I'm just going to grab the GeoTIFF and convert that on import to a LAS file. Now, if I'm converting back to points, I do need to set a little bit of information about it. And this was a DTM, so we're going to put that in the ground class. That looks okay. So it's a quick import from that. Oh, 
Uh, where did my Evo go again? Okay, why don't, uh, it's a crystal. I know you, I think you had a final poll that you wanted to run. Why don't we run that um, to wrap up and I'll just, I'll just get my Evo back up to show the results after we've run the poll. Okay, sounds good. I'll take ownership of the presentation real quick so I can launch that poll. All right, and our last poll question today is simply your interest in our TrueView solutions. If you don't think that TrueView fits into your needs, please feel free to email us at info at goq.com with further details. We'd love to have a discussion. Um, thank you again to Martin for conducting this webinar today and Derek for answering any questions that we have coming in. Just a reminder, we will be uh, distributing a recording of today's webinar and um, it will go to everyone who is registered. So I'm going to leave this open for just a little bit. A few more seconds, and then we'll close out this poll, and I will pass it back to you, Martin. Great. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. Thank you, everyone, for um, contributing to that, and now I will pass it back to Martin. Okay. Um, yeah, so just to wrap up, so basically I had pulled back in that that uh, raster DTM. Uh, now I've got my um, uh, my point DTM. I'm just displaying that as surface. But if I do look at my points here, and again, the main, the main takeaway is I've now converted this into a regularized grid DTM. So that's something that I can then um, push out, um, uh, you know, to anyone that needs that kind of a... Um, a structure to their to the train model or their surface model uh, relatively easy to to do so uh why don't we wrap up there again i thank everybody for your your time uh i apologize for going over a little bit later but hopefully you found this was this was useful it's always hard to to really cover you know everything we want to cover in an in an hour um if you really are interested and you'd like to see some of this in more depth and more detail and you're really thinking about you know where drone lidar drone cameras a true view evo system might fit in for you by all means do contact us uh we're more than happy to spend some some time with you one-on-one -on -one to go through this and and similar kind of uh workflow so you really do understand um, you know what, what you can and what you cannot produce from from the data uh, so with that why don't we uh, wrap up there and thanks everybody for attending thank you have a good day